Hi, it's KCCK's Culture Crawl. I'm Dennis Green, and my guest in studio today is Tim Hankowicz from Orchestra Iowa. Tim, nice to see you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. And you've got a uh, got a Pops concert coming up. We still call it kind of. Do we still call it the Pops series? Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's through the years we sort of morphed into things like this isn't quite a Pops concert. Film music isn't quite a Pops concert, but yet it's popular. Uh, yes, yeah, so yes. I mean that's sort of indicative of what the whole in- industry is going through now. Pop is yeah. in popular. Right, yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't get more popular than John Williams. <laughs> right. You know, February 8th, a couple days ago, he turned 90. And uh, so he's not going to be with us for much longer. And I think when he does move on to the great unknown, he will go down in history as clearly the best cinematic composer uh, of all time. And also likely as one of America's greatest cherished composers well, let's talk about that for a minute before sure. we dive into, sure. into specifics. But how does how does John Williams stack up as a composer? Uh, uh, you know, setting yeah. aside setting aside the success of of the movies that he's been associated with and all those melodies, uh, right? But, but you know, rank him as a composer. Oh, he's right up there, and I'll tell you why. Um, I think if you take a lot of other people's cinematic music, it's just mood music, and it requires the visuals to make it work. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense without him. It sort of wanders. Whereas John Williams, he's a master of orchestration. He no- just knows how to make the orchestra sound, and we can get into that a little bit. And this is going to sound kind of wonkish and 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 esoteric, but it's really important. He's oh, a ma- oh, give me the nerd okay, music stuff. Okay, I'll let my nerd flag fly high. We because are all about nerd music stuff here at KCCK. He is a master of form. Okay, now what that means is that how you how, the architecture of the music and how you write it. If you're really good at it, which he is, the music will stand on its own without the visuals. And so when you do put it in context of a movie, it has that much extra power. That's why you can do concerts. uh, uh, There's there's enough music out there to do at least eight programs of John Williams music. And each piece that he writes is a great concert piece. You can't say that about the majority of other film composers. Uh, I mean, they're they're well crafted in that they evoke a, an emotional response, but without the visual stimulus, uh, it's virtually meaningless and sort of wanders. The Star Wars soundtrack was the very first movie soundtrack I ever bought. Well, we <laughs> we're aging ourselves because we are of the same generation. Where I mean that that film and that soundtrack sort of like rekindled people's interest in symphonic music. Uh, I think. Uh, so so tell me sure. about tell me about you know what is it be 10 or 11 year old Tim? yeah 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 yeah, uh, yeah I, now you would probably already you were probably hip deep in piano lessons sure. already yeah. yeah and we're thinking that music was going to be a big part of your life how Correct. maybe how you made your living right did the did that music have an impact on it, you when it you heard sure it sure did first of all people didn't think i was weird <laughs> What do you mean you listen to Beethoven? No, I also listen to Star Wars. Oh, cool, man. That's awesome. Uh, and I remember my first recording, I bought the 8-track uh, to the uh, to the Star Wars film track. I mean, as soon as it came out, I was such a nerd about it. But now that I'm older and I can look at it more uh, historically, you know, uh, films used to have really elaborate soundtracks from the 1930s to the mid-50s and uh, well, late think 60s. Of, yeah, think yeah. think yeah. of Bernard Herrmann, Herrmann yeah, and yeah. Hitchcock. And, and then they were all virtually forgotten because uh, films went away from those lavish scores in the 60s and early 70s, partly due to expense. And so here comes John Williams, and he writes Star Wars, and it just blows everybody's minds, collective minds, because such possibility was all but forgotten until he came along. And now, because he was so successful doing that, he was the go-to guy, especially for Spielberg. You wanted a blockbuster? You call Williams, because he's going to write something that is absolutely amazing. Well, and the other thing about this, and perhaps even the, the bigger thing, is that not only did he do it, but he did it again. And, and again. again, and again, and again, absolutely. So this is really interesting. So I, I've been studying for this concert, and I've noticed something throughout the years. Because we're, if, if you were to look at the entire program, we're, we're doing music from his early career all the way to his most recent compositions. And I am absolutely astonished by the film industry because the soundtrack is the last thing that goes into production. I mean, the, the film is done and ready, signed, sealed, and delivered except for the music. And you have about two weeks to put it together before it actually hits the theaters. And so the time restraint, constraint on that is absolutely mind-boggling. And so when you look at William's early scores, when he was still trying to prove himself, 
he did his own orchestrations and to the, to the lay person that means deciding when the trumpet plays when uh, how are the strings are going to play i mean there's a whole art form behind that and so you look at his early scores they're extremely detailed they're extremely complex and they're, they're i mean you know he was trying real hard to put his best foot forward by the time of his middle and towards the end of his late career, he was so busy that he would write the melodies and the harmonies and some counter melodies and some ideas and then farm it off to an army of orchestrators. So, and, and what I've noticed that throughout the years, his orchestrations or the orchestrations, because many of them weren't done by him towards the end, are getting simpler and simpler and simpler. <laughs> Which also says something about how you progress through your career yeah. and realize that maybe you don't have to overthink things quite so much. Right. I mean, he's such an icon. There are uh, armies of people who kind of know how he writes. And so the style of orchestration remains, uh, remains there's a thread that remains uh, consistent. What it also tells me about is the loss, uh, the state of the art and the loss of it. Uh, I mean, film music is just not as sophisticated as it was that John Williams was writing, and certainly not what Max Steiner and Eric Korngold were writing in the 40s and 50s. Uh, so this, I, I kind of lament that. Um, but I mean, today, I think your, your, your greatest cinematic composers aren't writing for film, they're writing for um, video games. But the whole way in which the techniques of which they utilize the orchestra, I sometimes wonder if the state of the art is actually being lost a bit. Uh, the concert is Magical Movie Moments with John Williams, and we've kind of talked around this. Around it, yeah. But the program is exactly what you would expect. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. I had a hard time kind of figuring out how am I going to put the order to this. You've got to end with Star Wars. I mean, that is... Spoilers. Spoilers, but I mean, yeah, you can't do a, a John Williams concert without that. And that's such an iconic moment in his career and in American culture. And that's such a great piece. Um, and so, so we're performing works by, yeah, yeah, that include Star Wars. But there are other really popular movies at the time that are all but forgotten now. Um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I remember it came out there all around the same time as Star Wars did, too. Mm -hmm. And it was such a great film. And the music's great. Uh, but it's not on the forefront of popular culture anymore. Superman, uh, we're also performing. That's an interesting score because it's so strong that there have been many iterations of Superman films since the Christopher Reeves uh, version. And all of them. They s still in, use the same yeah. music. You cannot, that's how strong his music is. You cannot do a Superman music and not use his score because people will just boycott it. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I've, I've seen the list, so I know, but you talk about lesser known things like you like 1941. Yeah, terrible music. Terrible movie. Yeah, terrible, uh, movie. It's terrible movie, yeah. great Great music. Um, it was John Landis's follow-up to Animal House, and right. and also starred John Belushi. Right, and everybody was expecting, oh man, Animal House meets World War Two. Yeah, and that is exactly as bad as you imagine. Yeah, it yeah, it was not the finest moment. Yeah, but that's a perfect example of how the quality of the music can so outclass the film. I will also, uh, uh, in risk of getting uh, letters, I will also say the same about Hook. Uh, not not the best moment for um, uh, Robin Williams. But the music is just so great. So, uh, so there's a smattering of the great blockbusters, the not so great blockbusters, but the music survived. And some of the later uh, uh, scores that we're performing include like Lincoln. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of one of the last film scores that uh, um, John Williams has written. Uh, 19 uh, Midway, for example, I saw yeah. it on television not too long. And that's ago. the that's the and the new the, that's the, the remake. The remake the, that's the, the yeah. remake of it all. And uh, I'm still kind of a fan of the original, uh, but uh, the the remake is great. And of course, the music's stunning. And um, I think one of the things that uh, John Williams always was criticized for, especially in his early career, that turned out to be a feature and not a bug, was he was always criticized for being. Um, oh, what's the word for it? He, he would always borrow styles and ideas from other composers. Um, and every composer steals from everybody else. I mean, he or she who is most creative hides their sources best. But, you know, John Williams would um, model his music after Richard Strauss or Prokofiev or even in, in the film scene, uh, Eric Korngold who was a great Errol Flynn swashbuckler composer. And so people were, uh, were, were criticizing him for being that. But he had such an ear for the appropriate sound for the right moment. 
And so when I was studying um, the March to Midway, I realized that, oh my goodness, he is sort of riffing off the soundtrack to another very famous military movie, and that's the music of Patton. And mm-hmm. if you were actually to play the music of Patton and then the music of Midway, you'd go, oh, that melody sounds rather familiar. <laughs> and, but that's the one thing that, uh, one of the many gifts that, that Williams had, he had, an, he had a, an ear for the right style to meet the moment, but he was also a great tunesmith. I mean, what you're going to hear for every tune, from every piece that we play is like, oh, I remember that. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, and of course, that piece, I forgot about how great that was. All this and Harry Potter too. All this and Harry Potter too. I have to tell you, um, in, in the industry, uh, when musicians are auditioning for a position, they are often required to play really, really difficult excerpts just to prove they have the chops to get through the, 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 the daily grind of playing in an orchestra. And usually that's hard moments from the music of Stravinsky and Strauss and all that set. But now I see on audition lists that come up a lot is the ver- very beginning to Hedwig's theme from Harry Potter. Uh, and it's oh, coming really? up on major national auditions, not just for regional orchestras like ours, but for major orchestras like the Boston Symphony. I mean, it is hard to play. So that's the other thing about John Williams. It's not just child's play. He is exploiting the full capabilities of a professional symphony orchestra. Uh, and most, I would argue, most university orchestras, certainly not high school orchestras, would be capable of playing this music. So that's the other piece of this we want to make sure everybody knows. Just popular does not mean easy. Oh, no. I think anybody who, like, walks, uh, a musician who walks into a John Williams concert not think, not not fearing for their lives does not know what they're getting into because everybody has a really heavy lift. I mean, every part is virtuosic, and that's also what makes it fun why orchestras love playing this stuff. Before we go, here's a piece of John Williams trivia you may not know. Ooh, do tell. So you were talking about, you know, his early career and how he worked. Well, he worked for Henry Mancini. Yeah. And the and uh, the uh, piano player on Mancini's famous Mr. Lucky theme. Yeah, is that him? Johnny Williams. Johnny Williams. So yeah. I did find, um, so if you actually look at old reruns of Gunsmoke, there are a couple mm-hmm. episodes written by a young Johnny Williams as well. And it doesn't surprise me because one, song, one uh, film track that we are not performing that's one of my favorite scores of his is The Cowboys. Uh, and that was one of John Wayne's last films. And uh, so uh, to have Williams not only being in a galaxy far, far away, but also in Dodge, Kansas, uh, and to be able to capture the spirit of both, I mean, that just shows you what a genius he is. So I am really pumped to, ha- to be performing this concert this weekend. Magical movie moments, the music of John Williams with Orchestra Iowa, uh, Saturday and Sunday at the Paramount Theater, as usual, Saturday evening, Sunday matinee. Yep, 7.30 on Saturday, 2.30 on Sunday, and uh, you can get your tickets at the box office or call at 1-800-369-TUNE, T-U-N-E. Bring your favorite unchurched friend, the one who says, oh, I never, you know, I can't possibly enjoy symphonic music. Oh, are you kidding me? This will turn them around. It is the house of Spielberg and Williams, you know, so come in costume or you might be excommunicated. Okay. (laughs) All right. Costumes encouraged. Again, orchestraiowa.org for tickets and more information. I've been looking forward to this one for months. You and so me both. It's going to be it's going to be a great great time at the Paramount Theater. Tim, thanks for being here. Pleasure. Thank you. You can hear the Culture Crawl live on the radio many weekdays at 10:20 or download the podcast, watch or listen on your own schedule at kcck.org/culture or however you get your podcasts. I'm Dennis Green, and I'll talk to you later.